Guys, welcome back to another movie versus book. What's the difference? Sponsored by Unpopular Opinion, and today we're taking a look at my favorite movie, Full Metal Jacket, and the novel that inspired it. Guys, I'm really excited to be taking on this project because I never thought I was going to be able to make this video. It's shocking to many people when they find out that Full Metal Jacket was actually adapted from a book. The Short Timers is a semi autobiographical novel written by a Vietnam War veteran and a war correspondent, Gustav Hasford. His personal experiences in the war inspired part of the story, and he manifests his own personality into the novel's protagonist, Joker. And the reason I said I thought I was never going to be able to make this video is because the book is damn near impossible to find. In fact, it's one of the rarest books that's actually still in demand. Last I checked, a paperback copy of this book on Amazon is priced at 500 bucks. Every library I've been to doesn't have a copy. Any and all bookstores, antique or not, don't sell it. So needless to say, I've been looking for this book probably for the majority of the last decade. Now, you may be asking, why is that? How come such a sought-after novel lacks in availability? Well, the truth, the author didn't want the book to be reprinted under the title of Full Metal Jacket after the movie came out. Because he and director Stanley Kubrick had a rough falling out, which led to a lawsuit, and Hasford wanted nothing to do with the film. And ever since then, the book has been out of print. So, after years of fruitless searching, I finally just accepted I'm never going to get my hands on a copy. That is, until recently, out of nowhere, I just typed into Google, the short timer's autobook, and to my absolute amazement, an autobook ver or an audiobook version on YouTube is available. Overjoyed, I listened to the whole thing, and oh my god, wow. It is the best way to describe that book. Wow. And I'm not just saying this, but this might be my new favorite book. So without any further ado, let's grab our rifles and grab our guns, because this is for fighting, and this is for fun. And this is Full Metal Jacket, movie versus book. What's the difference? So I really don't know how to start this review, considering that Full Metal Jacket has the reputation of being an unintentional comedy, and many people only really seem to remember it or care about it for its first half, the basic training sequence. Now, I wouldn't consider Full Metal Jacket to be a gruesome or twisted movie. There are some scenes that can be too much for the faint of heart, but again, Full Metal Jacket isn't a dark movie. There are even some moments that are lighthearted and very relatable. However, the novel it's based upon is a fucked up book. It's fucking twisted dark, morbid, and crazy, in the bleak and evil sense of the word. Seriously, its outlook and view of the world is grim. And it's a, it's a disturbing book, I'm not gonna lie. And coming from a guy like me, that's saying something. The movie toned down the novel's darker themes and atmosphere and omitted a lot of the graphic and disturbing violence that takes place within the pages of the short timers. And you're about to find out why. The movie has two distinct sections. The first half is basic training at Paris Island, and then the second half is the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. The novel is broken into three acts, for lack of a better term. Basic training at Paris Island, fighting in the city of Hue during the Tet Offensive, and the final act is set in the jungle. However, what was surprising to me is that many of the novel's original dialogue makes it into the film intact, almost word for word, which is surprising considering that Stanley Kubrick has the reputation from deviating from his source materials. The movie starts out with the new recruits getting their hair shaved off after they arrive at Paris Island for basic marine training. They meet their senior drill instructor, Gunnery Sergeant Hartman. And the recruits of Platoon 3092 soon find out that the next eight weeks of their lives are going to be crazy. In the novel, the recruits are in Platoon 392, and they meet their, their drill instructor in a similar way. However, his name is Gunnery Sergeant Gerheim, and he's a World War II veteran who fought in Iwo Jima, and he's much less imaginative when it comes to clever insults and quick-witted one-liners. He mostly relies on physical punishments. In the movie, Hartman is portrayed by Arlie Erme, a real-life drill instructor for the Marine Corps. He had the exception of being allowed to improvise much of his lines. Being that he actually was a real DI, he drew on his past experiences and fit the part very well. So when you hear him say things like, One thing that you won't like, Private Snowball, they don't serve fried chicken and watermelon on a daily basis in my mess hall. Cause you are a disgusting fat body, Private File! Who the fuck said that? Who's a slimy little communist shit twinkle toe cocksucker down here who just signed his own death warrant? I don't like the name Lawrence, only faggots and sailors are called Lawrence. That was most likely written or improvised by him, which is mega rare for a Stanley Kubrick movie. Hartman's modus operandi is relentless, well-timed, and clever insults mixed with brutal PT. That is physical training for those of you who don't know, such as push-ups, long runs, obstacle courses, and jumping jacks. Sergeant Gerheim is totally different, and when I said he's more physical with his punishments, I don't mean he yells, drop and give me 20, I mean he beats the recruits, he full-on beats them. 
he and his other DIs will hit the recruits in places that don't show bruises, but they kick ass nonetheless. Gerheim in the novel is straight up evil. In FMJ, Hartman justifies his methods by this one line right here. I will motivate you, Private Pyle, if it shark dicks every cannibal on the Congo! So Hartman yells and berates his recruits as a motivational tactic to turn them into marines, into a tight squared away unit. He sometimes resorts to smacking his recruits for a quick lesson or disciplinary reason, but it's mostly open palm smacks, with the exception of when he rocked Joker in the stomach and strangled Pyle. And the most he ever hit a recruit in one incident was twice. Not saying that's good or anything, but he didn't like beat his recruits. Gerheim on the other hand, that's not the case. He straight up sadistically tortured his men. Honestly, the stuff he did just makes Hartman look like a loving grandma in comparison. This is directly addressed in the novel in a passage where Joker says, It's not like those old cheesy movies where the DIs push you or, quote, spank you because they love you and it's for your own good. No, Gerheim does it because he's a straight-up evil man and just because he can. For example, one incident in the book, they were drilling in bayonet training, and he takes a rifle and just smashes the butt into the face of a recruit, knocking out his teeth. The recruit then stabs Gerheim on the leg and dodges a few quick attacks thrown at him, but then Gerheim manages to knock him out with a backhand. He states that he was so impressed by that recruit, he straight up promotes him to squad leader on the spot, and that just shows you how crazy he is. On top of that, in the novel, there were seven Section 8 discharges because Gerheim pushes the recruits too far and is too brutal. In one passage, a Marine literally slits his wrists in the squad bay, and Gerheim doesn't even care. He's, he just gets angry and furiously screams, you have to clean up all the blood, and only when you're done cleaning, then you can go to a doctor. In both book and movie, our main character and narrator is Joker. He likes to be a goofball and do John Wayne impressions. Now, personality-wise, Joker in the book is more of a hard-ass, more cynical, and he's more tough. A lot tougher. Movie Joker, he's more like, more of a friendly guy, and he seems like he doesn't take anything seriously, and he also wears glasses, and on top of that, he's not physically intimidating. So when he goes around telling people that he's a killer, it's kind of like, <laughs> real funny nerd, but book Joker, he really does have the mind of a killer. Cowboy is mostly the same in both mediums. In the book, both he and Joker are more close, and Joker says the only reason they became friends is because he makes Cowboy laugh, and he thinks he's funny. However, when they get to Vietnam, Cowboy wears a Stetson hat as opposed to his steel helmet. Now, this is a huge difference right here. One of the most iconic characters from the movie is Leonard Lawrence, aka Private Pyle. Private Pyle is named that for his constant mistakes and never getting anything right. He's also really overweight and has a childlike persona that makes him come off as naive and simple. Whereas in the book, he's a skinny redneck hillbilly as Joker puts it. Also, his name is Leonard Pratt, not Leonard Lawrence. He in both mediums draws the wrath of the drill instructor for being bumbling and stupid pretty much. He also grins and has this dumb smile on his face that immediately draws the attention to him, showing that he's a simpleton and he thinks it's all a game. In the movie, he has that grin one time, but he gets it wiped off when Hartman chokes him. He still has the look of a naive kid a lot throughout the training sequences, showing he isn't fully squared away, but in the novel, no matter what, he keeps grinning for the first seven weeks of training. No matter how much Gerheim beats him mercilessly, he still smiles and grins, even when he's on the ground bleeding nothing works, and he won't wipe that smile off his face. However, every night, Joker can hear him crying in his bunk. After some time, Joker stands up to the head DI, not giving in to the intimidation tactics when it comes to his religious beliefs, and is promoted to squad leader. That's the same in both book and movie. Also, Gerheim makes Pyle and Joker bunkmates, and says that Joker has to take Pyle under his wing to help him. Now, in the movie, there's no problem with that at all. Joker and Pyle bunk together, Joker is encouraging and friendly, and Pyle actually improves significantly. However, in the book, Joker straight up says to Sergeant Gerheim that he doesn't want to bunk with Pyle, and he says that right in front of Pyle, too. Even with the extra help from Private Joker, Leonard Pratt doesn't make any improvements at all. No improvements. In the book, Joker is very uneasy and very uncomfortable around Pyle. In fact, he doesn't like him at all. He doesn't pity him, and Joker views him as a mentally retarded hillbilly. I mean, that might sound harsh, but that's the kind of character Joker is. There's a sequence in the novel where the recruits are training on a rope obstacle, and Pyle falls off of it into the muddy swamp below. He almost drowns, and Cowboy and Joker have to jump in to save him, and after they pull him out, he regains consciousness and begins to cry, and then Gerhan then chucks a canteen at Pyle, hitting him in the head, and yelling, Marines don't cry. In the movie, this scene was substituted for a shot of the recruits running through a mud puddle and Pyle trips. Joker tries to help him, but gets trampled in the process. So in the book, nothing is working on Pyle, and he keeps messing up and keeps getting into trouble. But there's a brief combat simulation in the novel where Joker has to be a sniper. He falls out of the tree when the branch he's sitting on snaps, and Cowboy eliminates him by fake killing him. Then Cowboy is promoted to squad leader. I only mention this because this is important for later, and it kind of foreshadows the climax. Now, in the movie... Pyle seems to be improving and everything is, is going smoothly. When the recruits have an inspection, that's when it all goes to shit, because Pyle's footlocker is unlocked, and Hartman goes berserk. He tears up the footlocker, and then he finds a jelly donut. Holy Jesus! What is that? What the fuck is that? 
that's when he decides to adopt the collective punishment method. From now on, whenever Private Pile fucks up, I will not punish him! I will punish all of you! And the way I see it, ladies, you owe me for one jelly donut! Joker's embarrassed and thinks Pyle made him look bad. Pyle admits that he needs help and can't do anything right. Joker then says, I'm trying to help you. Now, this conversation does happen in the book, but not in the same way. Joker and Pyle, they're in line for getting food. Pyle grabs Joker by the shoulder and basically says, I'm sorry that I can't do anything right, and I don't want other people to pay for my mistakes. I just need help. I've always needed help when I was younger. Joker moves away and totally ignores Pyle with the attitude of, don't touch me. But in the book, the inspection scene, the inspection scene, it's really different. In the novel, Pyle does fail the inspection, not because he smuggled the jelly donut into the mess hall into the squad bay. No, it's because he didn't shave. Still grinning, Gerheim orders all the squad leaders into the bathroom and tells them to pee in the same toilet. Just everyone pee in the same toilet. He grabs Pyle by the back of the head and dunks his face into the pee-soaked toilet bowl and gives him a swirly. After that, still nothing. Pyle is still grinning, and that's when Gerheim's had enough. That's when he adopts the collective punishment method, where the others have to pay for Pyle's mistakes while he is spared from it. I want to mention this real fast before I get into an infamous scene, that in the novel there was a part where it was actually Joker and a few of his friends who snuck food from the mess hall into the barracks. They steal some sandwiches, and they get caught, and then Gerheim beats them mercilessly, but at this point in their training they really don't care. I just thought that was interesting, and I thought it'd be cool to share. Now, in the book and in the film, there's the infamous blanket party scene where the other recruits restrain Pyle while he's asleep and beat him down with towels filled with soap bars as revenge for screwing up and getting them all into trouble. It happens the same way in both mediums. Pyle is held down with a blanket, and every future Marine gets a chance to hit him with their soap towel. Now, in the movie, the scene is a bit more personal and tragic, because unlike in the novel, Pyle's head was covered during the beating, so he doesn't see who attacks him. Also. Pyle and Joker weren't friends, so when Joker's pressured into hitting Pyle in the film, it's much more emotional and impactful, because before this scene happened, he and Joker, they were talking, and Pyle says everyone hates him, and he knew that no one liked him, but at least in his mind, he had the safety and security, knowing that he had one actual friend to fall back on and to have his back. So when he's getting beaten by his fellow recruits, he watched as Joker stood there doing nothing, and you can hear him muffled pretty much begging Joker not to do it. Then Joker wails on him. At first, Cowboy verbally tells him to do it, and then after some hesitation, Joker hits him once, then again, and then again, and again, and each strike gets more aggressive as he's finally just taking out his anger on Pyle. Then everyone goes back to their bunks, Pyle cries, and it can be heard all throughout the squad bay. Joker feels bad, he covers his ears because he doesn't, he doesn't want to hear Pyle cry, because he feels guilty. And like I said, being that Pyle trusted Joker and thought they were friends, then he looked him in the eyes as he heartlessly assaulted him. That was pretty tragic, and it seems like a betrayal. Now, in the novel, before the attack takes place, Joker says that Pyle was grinning in his sleep, and much like he did during the day, he just had that, that look on his face. Now, he wasn't friends with Pyle, and he really didn't like him, but he was hesitant about hitting him. And he describes that when all said was, like, all, is, all was said and done, and it was his turn to take a swing, he felt like the eyes of a hundred recruits were looking at him in the darkness. And Cowboy looks at Joker, then hands him a towel and soap. And that's when Joker goes to town. But like in the movie, he beats Pyle more intensely than the others. The next day, the scene is exactly the same, word for word, in both mediums. Pyle is no longer grinning. In fact, he isn't talking and he's totally silent while the rest of the recruits respond to the drill instructor's questions of What do we do for a living, ladies? In the novel, after the blanket party, that's when Pyle becomes a model recruit and no longer smiles like a fool. But he's eerily silent and each day he becomes more squared away. At one point, his eyes are described as being milk glass, basically showing how he's losing it. Also, Joker says that Pyle cleans his rifle more than any other recruit in the platoon. As the end of boot camp draws nearer, Pyle becomes more squared away each day. However, he's acting more independently of the platoon and altogether just stops talking. Gerheim leaves him alone, but he only does that because of his improvements. He just doesn't like how Pyle's removing himself from the other members of the platoon, so he lectures him on the true meaning of Semper Fi. Now, in the movie, we do get that taste that Pyle is losing it because his face goes from being that young, naive, boy-like character to more intense and nutty. Like, he's staring off into the distance more maliciously, and he looks like he's gonna explode. There's a scene in the movie where the future Marines are cleaning their rifles, and Joker is watching with concern as Pyle cleans his weapon and talks to himself, and is mumbling to his weapon, as if it was a person. Now, Joker's all concerned, but but that's the only time we see that, and it seems really innocent compared to the novel. In the novel, the recruits haven't heard a peep from old Leonard Pratt, and Joker catches him having full-blown conversations with his weapon. Like, he hears the voice of Pyle talking, then he hears an unsettling voice responding to Pyle, and he catches him doing this many times. And Pyle is so removed and self-isolated that he doesn't care that Joker sees him do this. Like, it's just... 
he doesn't care. So not only is Pyle talking to his rifle, but he's broadcasting the voice and words of what the rifle would be saying out of his own mouth, much like Gollum in Lord of the Rings. Book Joker tells a bunch of his fellow recruits while doing laundry about how Pyle talks to his weapon and thinks that he's a Section 8. At the mere mention of this, the others are immediately silent and shocked. Like, they all stop what they're doing and they don't say a word and look at Joker like he just curb stomped a puppy. They're all horrified and worried. And one of them, they, one of the recruits, he actually admits that he's been having nightmares of his rifle talking to him and then him talking back. But before he can go into details on it, Gerheim, he runs up, rocks him in the face, and kicks his ass. Gerheim had secretly overheard the conversation and angrily says that he doesn't want to hear any more talk about Pyle and his rifle, and he tells him to stop spreading rumors. Now, there's a theme in the book that during the first part, the, the characters are all struggling with their mental health, and they're concerned at certain happenings involving their rifles, such as them ending up in places where the owner didn't put them, or them moving on their own. And even Joker himself has a moment of lunacy where he recalls waking up in bed, cuddling and snuggling his rifle as if it was a teddy bear, and he has no memory of bringing it under the covers with him. Or one time his weapon ends up on his bed and he didn't put it there. So there's this element of the rifle having a mind of its own, or it has an unseen influence over their owners, and they have a morbid attachment to it. And that's what scares them. When they hear Piles talking to his gun, you know, they're freaked out because they're having episodes themselves and fear it's only a matter of time until they end up like Pyle, completely nuts. That's not really addressed in the movie. It's almost swept under the rug because Joker only sees Pyle talk to his piece one time and there's no mention anywhere in the film of the rifles metaphorically having a mind of their own and the owners fighting their own demons. Like in the movie, Joker confides in Cowboy that he thinks Pyle's crazy because he's talking to his gun and that's it. After that, there's no mention of it again and the subject is just dropped. One night in the book, the recruits are saying the famous rifleman's and the recruits hear Pyle speak for the first time since the blanket party. His voice is different though. He says the Rifleman's Creed louder than any of the other recruits and his voice is booming and it drowns out the other voices of the other recruits. His neck veins are bulging from screaming so loudly. Sergeant Gerheim is so impressed with Pyle that he says the other recruits should take lessons from Pyle since he's so squared away. That never happens in the movie, but like the book, Pyle is praised by the head drill instructor for being an expert marksman and it's complimented for it. After that, it's graduation and the recruits are no longer pukes. They're finally Marines. And and they're told once a Marine, always a Marine. Book Pyle wins a lot of achievement awards at the graduation ceremony. He's awarded the Outstanding Recruit for his platoon, and he's also awarded Free Dress Blues, and is allowed to wear that uniform when the graduating platoons pass review. The Commandant of Paris Island himself shakes Pyle's hand and congratulates him, and then he gives him an Expert Rifleman's Badge, along with a citation for the highest shooting score in the training battalion. Joker, he gets a promotion to Private First Class, and he also receives an Expert mar uh, Marksman Badge. Then Gerheim gifts Joker with his old PFC stripes. Movie and book, they have a scene where the Marines are given their orders. Most are being assigned to infantry training, but Joker is assigned to basic military journalism school. In the novel, it explains that the military journalists, they're sent to training in Indiana, and then after that, they have to go to complete an infantry training program. Now we get to the last night on Paris Island. Joker is assigned to Firewatch and is doing his rounds. In the movie, he walks into the head after he finds the door open and he sees a dark figure in one of the toilets. And wouldn't you know it, it's Leonard Lawrence. Pyle is totally insane at this point and greets Joker really malevolently. Hi, Joker. Pyle has the facial expressions of a monster, an evil monster. He's stuffing live rounds into a magazine and then he goes into a really impressive yet terrifying drill and ceremony fit. He loads his weapon, screams the Rifleman's Creed, and in doing so wakes everyone up, including Hartman. Hartman demands the rifle, and Pyle aims it at him, and Hartman at this point, he isn't so much playing the part of drill instructor anymore, and he screams at Pyle one last time, but gets shot. So Pyle straight up murders Gerheim. Joker watches him die, and he's scared. Pyle aims the weapon at Joker for a few tension-filled moments, as Joker's saying to go easy, man. Pyle sits on the toilet, and then he eats a bullet. He shoots himself in the mouth as Joker screams. Now. In the book, the setup is similar. Joker's on Firewatch on the last night of Paris Island, and he's, he's just walking around making his rounds. Until he hears two people talking. He goes into the squad bay to find who it is, and just to tell them, like, hey, shut up, I don't want to get in trouble. And then what he sees is a really disturbing sight. It's Pyle sitting on his bunk in the dark, talking to his rifle again. And the other voice he heard is the eerie voice of a woman that Pyle uses to convey the words of his rifle. Now, 
forgot to mention that in Full Metal Jacket and in the short timers, the drill instructors made the recruits name their weapons a girl's name to metaphorically marry them to the rifle. And in the novel, Pyle takes that literally. He named his rifle Charlene, and then Joker, he shines the light on Pyle, but Pyle straight up ignores him. And he, he's having a really creepy conversation with his gun. He's hugging it, he's cradling it, and he's telling it that he loves the gun and that, you know, I gave you the best months of my life, which that's really creepy. Then Pyle yells, I love you and I'll do it. He yells that so loud that it wakes up the whole platoon. Joker tries to shut him up, but to no avail. That's when Pyle finally acknowledges him. He sits up, he faces Joker, he blindfolds himself, and he field strips his weapon, saying this is the first time I'm seeing her naked. He caresses and fondles each piece of the rifle as he praises its beauty. He quickly reassembles it, babbling like a maniac, and that's, that's when Gerheim wakes up and he storms into the squad bay and he's furious. Pyle gets out of his bunk, he confronts Gerheim, and, and Joker quickly says, hey, Pyle's got a full magazine and he's locked and loaded. That's when Gerheim demands that Pyle hands over the weapon, but he quickly snaps and yells, no, you can't have her, I love her. That's when he aims the rifle at Gerheim and starts to caress the trigger. Gerheim, he becomes more calm, and he gives what is described as an evil werewolf smile. He says, Private Pyle, I'm proud, and that's when Pyle pulls the trigger. Gerheim falls to his back and then sits up momentarily to look at Pyle with that evil smile on his face, and then he falls back and he's dead. The other Marines are shocked, and they try to talk Pyle into dropping his weapon, but he ignores him like he doesn't even hear. He starts to talk to himself again, and he comments on how Gerheim was looking at his rifle and how he could read his intentions. Joker and the others tell Pyle to go easy in that quote, we are your bros, which in the novel, it's clear that Joker is only saying this because Pyle is threatening their lives, not because he means it. And you have a real sense that Joker, being that he and everyone else really hated Pyle and treated him so poorly, they're done for. There's, there's no reason why Pyle would spare them. Whereas in the movie, the look on Joker's face when he tries to reason with Pyle and Pyle staring at him, you have the sense that Joker was actually nice to Pyle, and that's the only thing that spared him from Pyle's wrath. However, in the novel, that whole, like, hey, Joker was nice to you, like, I'll probably spare him. Not really. That's, that's not the case. Joker and the others are screwed. Eventually, he turns to face the other Marines and he says, hey, we can kill you. We can kill all of you. And then he aims his rifle at Joker's face and... You know, Pyle's got a grin on his own face, but not like before when he was smiling like a child. His grin has the most cruel intentions behind him. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, Pyle's face has changed. Like, it goes from grinning to a look of surprise, kind of like he just snapped out of a trance, then to a look of confusion, and before he can do anything, his face it turns into terror as the weapon turns on him and moves up into his own mouth, and then he pulls the trigger. The passage that follows is a little confusing. Joker goes a little bit nutty explaining this, because he, he says that his own rifle talks to him, and while he holds it, thousands of spiders made out of blood run out of the barrel and crawl all over him. He reflects on Gunnery Sergeant Gerheim and thinks he was a good leader, and he tells us, the readers, that guns, the guns we love, don't love us back. And he makes it seem like the guns are sentient and perhaps Pyle didn't kill himself so much as the rifle turned against him. I don't know, it, it's really it's really weird to explain. It's a good passage, but really bizarre and confusing, and I can only assume it's a dream or hallucination. But he does mention that there was an investigation into the matter, but at the end of the day, despite how motivated Leonard Pratt was, he didn't have what it took to be a Marine. Well guys, that's gonna do it for the first part of this video. Guys, trust in me when I tell you that I wanted to include all the differences between the movie and the book in one project. However, if I was to do that, this would probably be over an hour long. So I figured it'd be best to divide it into two parts. Like always, my friends, if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and drop a subscribe. And if you want to see the second part of this video, go to the link in the description below. Click that and I'll see you in the second half of Full Metal Jacket, movie versus book. What's the difference?